very few days have actually changed the world. Here are some examples. Okay, let's see what you remember from high school history. The assassination of Archduke, Archduke Ferdinand started, do you remember? World War I, there you go, A plus, gold star there. Okay. How about, so I think about the dropping of the, the first atomic bomb that changed the course of history. Or I think about the moon landing, but we can probably dismiss that because we know that's all faked on a Hollywood soundstage. Or possibly the most important date in all of human history, December 13th, 1989. That is the birth of Taylor Swift. Didn't think I could pull off an Oppenheimer and a T-Swift reference within the first few minutes of the sermon, but there you go. So back in 2006, uh, author and historian Highwell Williams wrote a book identifying 50 defining events in world history. He defined 50 of them. 50 of them across 2,500 years. Now that is just one two hundredth of a percent of all the days of human history that actually changed the world. One two hundredth of a percent. That's how rare these world-changing days really are. But in one weekend, about 2,000 years ago, there was not one, not two, but three days that changed the world. Three days from Friday to Sunday that changed the course of human history. These had such a profound impact on humanity, we're still talking about them today. Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday. These are three days in which Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. And over the next three weeks leading up to Easter, we're going to examine each of these days. We're going to look at why they happened. Okay, I'll say that again. We'll understand why they, <laughs> we'll understand why they happened. I know, dude, my watch does that at the weirdest times. Why they happened, the difference they made to the world, and most importantly, the difference they can make in you. Now, before we dive into Friday, I want to make a connection for you. So nearly every week, we recite the Lord's Prayer together. And it, or, we also do the Apostles' Creed. In the middle of the creed are these lines. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. We just did that a few minutes ago. Those three, those references, that's what happened over these three days. That part of the creed directly speaks to these three days. It's what this series is all about. And my hope that after spending a few weeks with us and listening and learning, that you'll have a greater understanding, a greater appreciation for those 25 little words that are a part of the creed. So today, we'll start with Good Friday. This was the day that Jesus was arrested, tried, and executed. So let's do a quick review of the key events. So Jesus was betrayed by Judas and arrested by the, the Jewish leaders. He was sent to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. He was condemned, beaten, and forced to carry his own cross to the site of the execution. He was crucified, and he dies. And a few of his followers, very few, buried his body in a tomb. Now, there were more things that the Bible describes happened that Friday, but that's the core of it. Now, Scripture repeatedly says that these events had to happen. We see that in the Gospels and in the letters, that these events had to happen. But why? Why did it have to go down like this? And what good could possibly come from all of that injustice? 
So to answer that, we have to get a little philosophical this morning. So you up for that? Your brain's ready for, for a little bit of philosophy? So there's a branch of philosophy called metaphysics. And metaphysics deals with the fundamental nature of existence and reality. So for, for, those, who, for those of you who love to think high thoughts, you're going to be digging this. Because we're going to get a little metaphysical together. Now, there's a handful of big metaphysical questions. What is existence? Why are we here? What's the problem of existence, and what's the solution? Now, today I want to focus on the last two. What's the problem, and what's the solution? Now, understanding these two questions and the way different people and different religions over time have answered it is fundamental to unlocking the significance of Jesus' crucifixion on Good Friday. So, every religion every worldview, every life philosophy has to answer these two questions. What's the problem? What's the solution? Now, right now, you have an answer to this question. I guarantee it. We all have to answer it. In fact, you probably even have a couple answers to the question. And it's, it's somewhere buried deep in your psyche. You have an answer to the questions. What's the problem? What's the solution? See, these answers have been formed, or in some cases malformed, by your own culture, your family of origin, the media you consume, and your religious background, if you have one. All of that shapes to answers, and you have the answers. It all just depends what shaped it. So you have answers. So does every world religion. So let's first look at just the first question. What's the problem? The existential problem. Now, here's a quick survey of the major world religions on how they would answer that problem. Okay? First, Judaism says that it's a broken shalom, a broken peace and relationship between humans and God. That's Judaism. Islam says that it's ignorance that leads to disobedience of Allah. Hinduism says it's attachment to the material world. Buddhism teaches that it's suffering. Christianity calls it sin. Now, many of these answers actually have significant overlap. Whether you call it sin, disobedience, wrongdoing, evil, injustice, unethical behavior, most worldviews can agree at least in part, that there's a problem, and maybe even partly what the problem is. But the answer to the second question, what's the solution? These vary considerably. In fact, that's why anyone who ever says to you that all, all religions are basically the same doesn't actually know any of the religions. <laughs> because the answers to the problem are so significantly different across religions and worldviews. Now, we looked at some, some of the major religions. Let's look at some of the worldviews. Because here's the catch. All these answers, these answers are not created equal. There are better answers and there are worse answers. And in fact, a lot of the answers that kind of float around us have some pretty significant flaws to them. So here are a few examples of the ways different religions and worldviews answer the problem of life. What's their solution? So let's start with Old Testament Judaism. So in the Old Testament, God gave the Israelites the sacrificial system. And we saw a little bit of that in the video. We saw that, that it, God gave them the sacrificial system for the forgiveness of sins. Now the problem was... It was only temporary. You had to keep coming back to the temple every week, every month, every year, over and over and over again. Let's look at Hmong shamanism. Now, shamanism, and some of you know this well because maybe your parents are shamanists. You have families who are shaman. So you understand this. Your daughter gets sick. You call the shaman. 
They enter the spirit world, intercede on your behalf. They enter the spirit world, and, and the spirits will tell them what, what you have to do to appease the spirits. And hopefully, your daughter gets better. But there's problems with this as well. Like the Israelites, you have to keep going back. Every time something bad happens, you have to call the shaman back. Also, it can be costly. Whether you, whether you pay the shaman, or maybe you have to kill a cow, but there's almost always a cost to shamanism. And also, it creates this life of fear that you never know if you're going to do something that will upset the spirits. And you have to call the shaman back. You never know. Now, turnabout's fair play, so let's talk about American culture. So the American dream promises that anyone, regardless of your background, can achieve success and prosperity through hard work. That's the American dream. You can do anything, you can be anything you want. And if you're not achieving that dream, then you have to work harder. It comes down to individual effort. But most of us know that's not simply true especially for women and, and people of color. We know that there's some systemic racism. There's disparities between education and healthcare access. There's a wage gap between men and women. There's unfair housing practices against the poor. And there's so much more. This is not a level playing field, the American dream. It's very disparate. So now lastly, let's talk about one more, postmodernism. People say we live in the, in the postmodern age right now. We've passed modernity, we're in postmodernism. Well, now this one, you know it's the, there's no absolute truth, or shorthand version, you do you. Okay? Now, postmodern solution is to abandon modernity in the past, abandon conventional wisdom, and pursue your own meaning, purpose, and success. And that's where you'll find fulfillment. That's the promise of postmodernism. But now, as we move into a post-postmodern world, we can see that postmodernism is actually deeply flawed. What happens when an Israeli truth conflicts with a Palestinian truth? You get war. Right? And, and we know that, that this is flawed because we see it ourselves. How can you possibly point out injustice if everyone is simply doing what feels right to them? If everybody is living, you do you. What happens when someone's you conflicts with another person's you? I would even argue that nobody actually truly believes postmodernism. And the reason is because we're all appalled by evil. We see it, school shootings, blatant races, racism, abusive corporate greed. All of that stuff feels wrong. And then there's cancel culture and online shaming. True postmodernism has no place for that. They have no explanation for that. And that's why I tend to agree with the writers who are saying that we're actually in a post-postmodern world. Every worldview has its flaws. And that's where Christianity's answer to the metaphysical problem of life is fundamentally different, and I believe fundamentally better than everything else out there. Every other answer you've run across or could come up with, I believe that Christianity offers the best answer to the metaphysical problem. So what if... What if you could get rid of the endless repetition of the Old Testament sacrificial system or Hmong shamanism? What if you could get rid of the fear or cost of shamanism? What if you could get rid of the individual guilt and responsibility of American culture or the moral anarchy of postmodernism? What if there was a better way? And there is. And that's what happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross. 
That's what happened on Good Friday. Now, how? How did all this happen? How, how does it answer the question of the problem of a broken world and broken people? And why is it better than any other worldview? Well, let's begin with two things. Two things about God. God's love and God's justice. Now, God's love is best captured in the most famous Bible verse in the entire book, John 3.16. For God so loved the world, that's us, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, God's love for the world, God's love for you, that's what motivated him to send Jesus to die. But why did he have to die? That's God's justice. See, we understand justice. Wrongdoing has to be punished. And when it doesn't, we feel the anger. In fact, if God didn't punish wrongdoing, he would not be a just God. He would not be worthy of our worship. And we, we all understand this. That's why we get upset when we see injustice due to a person's race, gender, orientation, or class. We want punishment for wrongdoing. We want justice in our world. We want punishment. We just don't want it for ourselves. We want justice. So wrongdoing, what the Bible calls sin, has to be punished. Love and justice. Now, this is where the other worldviews get interesting. Okay? Old Testament Judaism, that emphasizes justice. The penalty for sin was paid by the shedding of an animal's blood. Mong shamanism also actually relies heavily on justice. It's a very transactional process. If your parents or your family or, you, or if you've been around Mong Sham rituals, it's very transactional. Something's wrong, you do something, the wrong is absolved or re resolved. Um, American individualism. This favors love. Love for self, love individual rights, and love for country. And then postmodernism actually takes love to an extreme, where love is love. And you can't impose your rules on someone else. As a result, it's actually really difficult to justify injustice under true postmodernism. Now, God's solution. Jesus dying on the cross for us. It satisfies God's justice by punishing sin. But it also satisfies God's love by returning us, his beloved creation, into right relationship with him. Jesus dying on the cross satisfies God's love and God's justice. Now, all of that happened on Good Friday. And it's what the Bible calls atonement. Now, atonement means to pay a debt, to make something right. And again, that's something we actually understand. The word itself comes from an old English combination of words that literally says, at one minute. Atonement makes us at one with God because it restores the relationship, the broken relationship with God. We are now at one with him. Now, if you hurt your spouse or your friend, you do something insensitive or selfish and it hurts them, you can atone for your wrongdoing. You can apologize. You can acknowledge their pain. You can ask them what you could do better. Or, my favorite, is you can buy them Chipotle. With guac. This is no time to cheap out. Okay? Now, that, that is great and wonderful and delicious. But on an existential level, a whole lot more than extra guac is needed for atonement. So, let me explain spiritual atonement 
with four different terms. Four different terms the Bible uses to describe atonement, what Jesus did on the cross. So the first is sacrifice. Now, for you theology nerds, okay, this is called expiation. Expiation or sacrifice. Now, what this means, this is the removal of your sins. Jesus Christ took our sins from us onto him and died as a sacrifice for us. So John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was years before he ever died on the cross. Hebrews 9.26 says that, but he, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's sacrifice. That's expiation. Atonement in Jesus' death is the removal of our sins from us. Okay? Second, another theology word, propitiation. Propitiation. This is the removal of God's wrath, God's punishment. This is what it means that Jesus took our place. He took our punishment. That by dying in our place, Jesus removed the wrath of God, the punishment of God for sin. And so Romans 5.9 describes it like this. Since we have now been justified, made right with God, by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him, through Jesus? Atonement in Jesus' death is the removal of our sins and the removal of God's wrath because of our sins. The third term. This one we're a little more familiar with. Reconciliation. Reconciliation. This is the removal of our separation from God because of our sins. We are separated. God is holy. We are not. So outside of Christ, we are separated from him. Jesus removed the sin and the wrath that separates us from God. And thereby bringing us into right relationship with him. Jesus restores the Hebrew shalom in our relationship with God. So here's how Colossians 1, 22 and 23 describe it. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. Without blemish and free from accusation. Some of you need to pay attention to those last couple words because you are living accused. And you need to understand that under Jesus, we can live free from accusation. So Pastor John Piper summarizes it like this. The wisdom of God has ordained a way for the love of God to deliver us from the wrath of God without compromising the justice of God. Let me say that again. The wisdom of God has ordained a way for the love of God to deliver us from the wrath of God without compromising the justice of God. Atonement in Jesus' death on the cross for you, for me, removed our sins, removed God's wrath, and removed our separation from God. That's what happened on Good Friday. And that's why that day changed the world. No other worldview, no other world religion, no other life philosophy can offer a solution that is as comprehensive as loving, as restorative as Jesus dying on your behalf. He is better than the Old Testament sacrificial system because he is the perfect sacrifice once and for all. He's better than shamanism 
because he paid the price. He battled the spiritual realm. And he gives you assurance in him. He's better than American individualism. Because we can't do it ourselves. Our power is limited and the system is built against a lot of you. We can't fix our selfishness. We can't free ourselves from fear. We can't cleanse our guilt. But Jesus can and Jesus is better than postmodernism because in God we can find perfect fulfillment and not at the cost of other people. We can discover who we are and whose we are. True fulfillment can be found in God through Christ. And all you have to do is believe in Jesus. You can, you can believe in something else, but nothing, nothing offers you a better solution to the existential problems we know are out here. Nothing offers you a better solution to the problems of the world or the problems of your heart. So I close and I call you with the same call that the Apostle Peter made in Acts chapter 3. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. What a promise that your sins may be wiped out. Well, that's not the end of it. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Do this, and maybe, maybe today might be a day that changes your world. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for loving us so much that you would send him to die, to suffer for us. God, you could have let us take the punishment, but you didn't. So thank you that your love is abundant. Let us never take that for granted. Let us never abuse your love. Let us never cheapen your love for us, God, by ignoring or de denying the price that Jesus paid. And let us never ignore this by turning to other, lesser, inferior solutions when you have provided the best one, the most comprehensive one, because you did the work. So, Lord, let us turn to you. For the first time, the 50th time, or the 500th time, let us turn to you and today say yes to Jesus. So I pray, I pray for every person here, every person watching me online, Lord, that they say yes to Jesus in whatever way they need to today. And help us all turn away, cast out the worldviews that we've also believed and added on to our, our faith and our mind and our heart. Let us banish these other solutions, these inferior solutions from our heart and give it all to you, God. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.